Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Monday Design Forum. Uh, my name is Jose, and uh, I'm going to hand over Kirsty Mate, that is our course coordinator for, and is also the host of today's Design Forum. And I'm not going to take more time of the presentation. So thank you, Kirsty, for taking care, and welcome, Jan, and thank you for coming and joining us. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. Thanks, Jose. Thank Thanks, Jose. Um, hello everyone. Um, as Jose said, I'm the course coordinator for, well, my name is Kirsty Marte. I'm the course coordinator for um, the applied design course at the University College, uh, for those who don't know me. Um, and yes, I would, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Jan, but before I do, I just want to do an acknowledgement to country. So um, I acknowledge that we're meeting and working on Aboriginal land and I pay my respects to the Palawa people, the traditional owners of this land, its skies and waterways, and I pay honour to elders past, present and emerging. So today um, we are really delighted to have um, Jan Ashdown with us um, to talk about not only experiential graphic design, which might be a new term for some people, and um, but to really talk about experiential graphic design in relation to how um, this type of design discipline, as well as many other types of design disciplines, I must say, but this one really specifically has a lot to do with um, the diversity that we find in our communities. So she's going to talk a lot about how um, experiential graphic design or XGD works with um, diversity and how that leads to really extensive collaboration um, in that design process. So Jan, just to give you a little background on Jan. So Jan's a principal, um, sorry, is the principal and director of the Australian um, component of the international firm of Entro Communications. She's had over 25 years of specialised experience in um, experiential graphic design. And as it is a new discipline, she's probably one of the very first to really start leading in this area. With an engineering, fine art, design and project management background, Jan combines technical skills and creativity to ensure the project vision is effectively translated into the built environment. She's a highly skilled design thinker with the ability to see the whole story from the strategy to the execution and across all of those um, touch points um, that she's so passionate about. So what happens is that she delivers these really thoughtful design and, and, um, and really exceptional outcomes to improve that human um, experience. So she's really strong in design sensibility and empathy and really ensures um, like this really enlightened design solution um, with meaningful outcomes. And I think that's really what the, um, the premise of her presentation is going to be around today to be meaningful across a lot of diversity that engages our hearts and minds um, for everyone who uses those designs. So welcome, Jan. And we're really excited to uh, to see your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty, and thank you, Jose. Um, hi, everyone. I am really excited to be here today. Uh, as Kirsty said, uh, yeah, it's probably one of the early people getting into this industry. And like all my colleagues, I accidentally fell into XGD. Um, and as Kirsty said, I've studied engineering initially, and then fine art and graphic design, and then project management got thrown in there and mashed up and then I somehow ended up at one point working for a signage design company long before it was even called wayfinding so um, anyway I'd like to share a little bit about intro before I really dig into diversity and collaboration just to give you context so intro is interdisciplinary uh, with backgrounds ranging from graphic design architecture industrial design, communication design, and even neuroscience. So our research plays a really important role in our work. We're a place branding and experiential design firm, designing environments with the intent to shape people's everyday experience by helping create design solutions for the built environment 
which is what we're, we're looking at. Um, here's, I just thought I'd include, this is our Toronto team. We do have smaller teams across New York, Calgary, Vancouver, Zurich, and now Studio, um, but they're all growing. And the reason why I wanted to talk a little bit about intro is to give you a snapshot into what we do. So you can see just how diverse XGD is. It's narrow field, but it's so diverse. There's so much depth and breadth to our work in all of these disciplines. So you can see from research to placemaking, communication design, graphics and project management. And then you look at all the design streams we just cover so much and specialize. And then you look at all the sectors. We work in every sector of the built environment. So we'll get started. So um, universal or inclusive design is often confused with simply designing for people with disabilities. But it's much more than that. Quite simply, it's about designing for people, regardless of who they are. So it's a philosophy that encourages us to consider how size, shape, age, gender, ethnicity, and so on, spoken languages, culture, customs, and even diets can shape the way we interact with the world and the products and services that inhabit it. More importantly, it's about designing in light of this understanding. Uh, so universal design is a concept which environments are designed to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaption of specialized design. It promotes design that's usable and inclusive and universally acceptable. And here's some of the, well, the universal design principles. Um, they re represent best practice guidelines in design accessibility. And what we like to say is Ability is a spectrum, so we turn it on its head. So each, each of us will have different abilities throughout our whole lives. And you can look at this. So when we were children, our reading height, um, reach distance, cognitive abilities and language skills are different than most adults. And then as we get older, our mobility, cognitive functions, reach distance and sight may change. And then sometimes when we have an injury, there might be a shift in abilities. But then again, when we become parents, pushing a pram may put us in the same situation actually as someone in a wheelchair. Um, and anyone who's pushed a pram will realize that with escalators and so on um, and stairs. So typically we rely on all of our senses to find our way, but then what if we lose any of these abilities? So that's where we start looking at accessible wayfinding. So it's not accessible to all. It isn't just helping others. It actually will help us all. Before we go into the details of accessible wayfinding, let's just lightly touch on what wayfinding is. It includes all of the ways that help people navigate from place to place. So sight, touch, braille, tactile, signage, sound and smell. For example, smell of food court and noise from a food court. Um, linear wayfinding, point to point. Um, so similar to step-by-step -step instructions you get from Google Maps. Spatial wayfinding when you're navigating with something like a map. And we like to think that wayfinding is more than just signage. For example, the moment we check online and look for directions, our wayfinding journey has actually begun. So accessible wayfinding must be logical and easy to understand. So regardless of the person's cognitive language, mobile and visual abilities, directions can be understood. And this means things like floor and room numbers, they must be sequential from the point of entry, otherwise it's very confusing. Nomenclature for directions must be consistent and messages should be concise so that we don't overload people with too much to remember. Um, we, we can't contain that too much information so that we release that as we go, um, as we move around. Um, for example, clarifying the sequence of floors above and below grade or ground helps, helps us um, 
locate ourselves within a vertical space. So I'll just show you some examples here by Studio MTA. Consistent floor numbers and really clear directions, the directional signage there. And as you're getting out of lifts, very clear what floor you're on. And again, consistency, room numbers and clear directions. And here's another floor. So again, consistent for floor numbers. And there's a directory there as well. And there's a close up of the directories. Um, so clear building naming. In this project, there was three different buildings that campus was so big. So that's when you start to get complex um, wayfinding solutions. So you've got to direct to get people into the correct building and then from there on. Um, so then you take that through. So confirmation all the way. So you're not getting confused. You're getting in or out the lifts here and you exactly, you know exactly where you are. You're in building A. And here's an example of the directory board from that same campus. So just look at clear messaging. This is a really good um, example to have a look at. So uh, in a hospital, which this is, it's highly complex with all the different areas. And you look at that and think, well, you know, how can you pull that apart? So if you start to emit difficult wording, it becomes easier to understand and remember so you drop out all of the words in grey and already you start to see, oh, okay, that's digestible and you end up with, with this list. So then you can take that into your wayfinding and naming. So uh, establishing information hierarchy also helps. So you chunk these together and then it's easier for the brain to work out what's first, what's secondary and also what's special. And we'll just take a quick look at Braille. So this example is an example of, bra sorry, a Braille inside a lift um, next to the lift buttons. And this one's another one, a recent project that Entro's done. And um, if you look there closely, you can see the Braille actually on the hand rails. And in another project that we've recently done too, and um, that's got tactile information so anyone can read that but also it's tactile if you only have a certain level of vision impairment but it also has the braille there for braille readers. So I'll just take a quick look at powerful pictograms. Um, so never underestimate the power of clear messaging through pictograms. We were designing a theatre pictogram recently for the Australian Museum um, and we love the simplicity of the retro icons, but then we thought, well, are they really clear to users? Do they mean theatre to everyone? So what we did, we asked the creative director's six-year-old daughter and a nine-year-old son, and we were hoping that, that they would say theatre to all of them, uh, but their answers really surprised us because we've got theatre for the one that we we kept as our design and then we had people on a train and they thought the next one was a microphone and the last one was a pencil sharpener so that was fantastic for us we, apart from being surprised we got a lot of laughs so uh, we came back to the first one and we just rethought the clarity of some of the most utilized pictograms um, for the rest of the project such as the symbol for toilets so we'll have a look at pictogram for uh, pictograms for inclusive amenities. Um, they, pictograms provide unambiguous and universally recognized information. It bridges um, the gaps between language barriers and simplifies messages. So the design challenge. Uh, the simple answer is not to focus on identities. There's a, a pictogram at the top there, which is the half man, half woman. It's not inclusive at all. Um, many people identify outside of male, female identities. It's not inclusive. So these signs actually don't tell you anything about what to expect inside the amenity. Signage should really represent the service that's provided. So if we look at this, um, it's, it's inclusive. So, Signage alienates certain groups. 
But the message they receive is that the service does not apply to them or they're not allowed to access it. So it should not emphasize who's walking in, but who's going to use, what they're going to use, sorry. Um, so not only does the symbol of a toilet represent toilets, bathrooms, amenities, it's also gender neutral. And here's some good designs of inclusive pictograms along the top row. And there's a lot to look at here, but um, this set's actually from a work in project, uh, progress um, project that we have going at the moment. It's a community wellness project and it has an extensive range of inclusive design requirements. There's hydrotherapy and warm water pools and off those there's adult change, which is called changing places. And we're all being educated to this. So they're adult change areas. So a carer, for example, can bring somebody to the warm water pool or the physiotherapist, but they have to use the adult change um, to look after people who need those spaces. And um, other areas of this, this project, there's specific change rooms suitable for a diverse culture community. So you can see um, here we've got um, baby change, but then baby change accessible. Not all the change room um, options are family change. There's a group change. Um, it's, and then there's multi-purpose creches. Um, it goes on. It's, it's quite extensive and a fun project. So um, here's some examples of inclusive mes messaging with a playful feel. I'll just take a quick look at these other areas of legibility. So um, using caps and lowercase as opposed to um, um, capital letters altogether, your brain reads the top line as a pattern and is much um, quicker to read than everything in a block. Um, this is a, a um, one that you would have noticed too. So black text on a white background is not as legible as the black background, but it's also 12% larger or it appears 12% larger. So I've just flipped back, you can see. It's very interesting how the brain reads this. Um, so really, if you start looking at all of those areas that I've spoken about, um, we like to have this um, checklist to make sure in our work with our clients that we've heard them correctly, we understand what they want for the brief, but it's also a brief to us to say, well, did we hit the mark? Did we get it right? So for this, we're just looking at logical spaces, clear messaging, legibility, and consistency should equal clear wayfinding, accessible wayfinding. Now, collaboration within project teams. So this is a really big area, but I'm, I've only got a couple of slides here. Um, everything I've showed you is collaboration. We work in collaboration with all other teams. So here's an example um, of a current project that we're working on. So at the top, um, I've got three areas for the client. So often and mostly now there's multiple stakeholder teams that make up the client. Um, so we have to deal with and learn how um, to interact with what each part of the stakeholder teams require. They're coming to the project often from marketing or there'll be facilities and they require different things from us um, for us to collaborate, collaborate with them so that they can get um, do their job and have the right solutions for their part of the team. Uh, there's also an external PM, project manager often, um, and that's in the blue box. Um, and that's interesting as well, because then the architect who we come under is, is actually working through the project manager and then to the client. So the project manager is controlling everything. So the, the architect there and off to the right, there's a list and it's just a high level list. Um, all the consultants come in under the architect and we're all working together. So we collaborate with each other, some more than others, like the landscape architect, we collaborate with really specifically because we're doing external works 
as well as internal works. And so that's really important to have everything integrated. So the landscape with our signage works for external, for example. Um, then there's environmental consultants, there's acoustic engineers, structural lighting designers. In this case, for this project, there's an aquatics designer and there's usually always a traffic engineer. Then I've got XGD there, so the experiential graphic designers and wayfinding. Um, so we really, it demonstrates how we're working with the whole, the wider design team. And then over to the left here, I've just put certification and accessibility consultant. Now, this is an important point that Kirsty and I were discuss discussing the other day. Um, if we're not collaborating with the accessibility consultant from the, like the front or at least the mid part of the project, what happens is we're designing accessibility um, part of our project without input and direction from the consultant, we'll get to the end of the project and then they'll say, well, no, that's not approved. And it has happened on other projects. Um, we all have to scramble to get it right so that the accessibility consultant will approve it and give it the tick because then the whole project, the architecture, the whole building has to go through a certifier to certify the whole building. So then the accessibility consultant is really working in with the certifier. So if we don't get through the first part with the accessibility consultant, it holds up everything. So, you know, that Kirsty and I were saying the other day for a full and rich outcome, the collaborative process really needs to happen early. Um, it's, you know, good in theory, it doesn't always happen, but uh, we do our best and that's the ideal. We're striving to that all the time. So I'm just going to give you some project examples and look at some case studies. Um, this is um, some inspiration and benchmarking images on the project that I was just mentioning. Uh, there's, it's an area that is highly diverse in culture. Um, so what we've done here, we're looking at drawing from the colour and design from flags of all the countries represented in the community. So that's just one of our concepts we're looking at at the moment. Um, there's another project that we've worked on. It's uh, called Daniel Spectrum. Um, it's This project's in Canada. It's an artistic, cultural and social hub of the community. It's very similar to the project we're working on now. What you're seeing here is tiny little flags representing the countries of um, the diverse community. So then we did a study looking at how could we extrapolate all the colours and um, patterns, if you like, and bring that into our work. Um, so then coordinating with the architect, um, completely integrated work, and then bringing the colours into the facade design. And then also in the internals, so you see there colour banding wrapping around and then colour coding with doors and directories as well. And then another shot of the external of the building. It's really creating huge impact. And it's really, I think, um, get hits at the heart of what you're doing by bringing the flags. And I find even though people might look at that and think it's an architectural solution, somehow it has more meaning and hits you in the heart, even if you don't know and that's why we're doing our work too, because um, it's not often evident, but it creates a beautiful and um, grounded design solution that comes through in the work rather than just aesthetics for aesthetics purposes. Jan, so, just to interrupt yeah. you, sorry, before you move on, um, what is Daniel's spectrum? Like what is the- Oh, the okay. Um, let project? me just go back. Um, so it's an artistic, cultural and social hub. Um, it, um, I think in, in this hub, there is, um, it's like what we would call, uh, we would have here as a, like a community center where you can go to do courses, art courses, all sorts of different courses. But there's also, um, spaces for artists and their families to reside. So there's little apartments in there as well. 
So it's it's a really amazing space. Um, so yeah, it's, I've never seen anything like that before with residences on site as well. Oh, thank you. That really helps with the context of why that was important, the flags. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thanks, thank Kirsty. You. Well, we'll just have a look at the Australian Museum in Sydney. Um, so from an accessibility perspective and looking at everything that we've just looked at earlier, wayfinding in itself is accessible because it is our jobs to make everything completely clear to make sure that we're directing people um, in and in giving clear messages but also not keeping not giving too much information so that we're directing along the way um, of the route um, so here you can see on the left the building map so that's if you walk in and you could stand there and look at the map um, We've also got um, large level numbers for vertical orientation. So on every floor above, so you've got the G there for ground and so on, it goes up and also underneath ground. So we have lower ground and basement. Uh, the, this is a drawing of the map here. Um, I've just put that in because um, you can see here that the map that's the lighter color that is coordinated to the floor that you're standing on right there. And there's another map that's um, on the lower ground. And so the lower ground floor plan is the lighter color to coordinate with that. So you know where you are at all times. So as well as the building maps, we designed um, paper versions. So they're, um, they're on the back of the museum's marketing brochures saying what's on. Um, there's also downloadable PDFs on the website. We've created uh, white background uh, PDFs and also black background PDFs to download. And that's depending on um, your visual impairment and what's um, readable and not readable. Um, we've also designed Google internal maps. So once the the Google site went up, so you can now um, navigate on your phone via Google throughout the museum. Uh, we're also um, with the museum designing for neurodiversity. Uh, there's provision for quiet zones with coding for low, medium and high sensory galleries. You can see at the bottom left there, the coding. So one bar and green is low sensory. So that's um, quiet, well-lit areas with fewer people and low noise levels. The medium sensory, there's light areas with few people, some audio and visual noise. And high sensory is busy areas with a mix of multimedia, loud, loud noises and or low lighting. Perfect example is the dinosaur gallery. Um, low lighting and high spotlights on the dinosaurs and the massive big dinosaur um, growls very loudly every few, like 10 minutes or so. So that could be quite scary if you have suffered from autism um, and you need to have quiet spaces. Um, the other thing that the gallery has done, ha um, they've introduced once a month, they have early birds. Um, so you can bring people before the gallery opens, the museum opens, sorry. Uh, and you can spend time there with the staff. Um, you know, there's there's something at the moment where that you can bring kids in for school holidays, and they're putting a stick insect insect on the on the hand of the child. So there's kind of really lovely programs that the museum are running, and I think that's great to see because we're actually designing for neurodiversity for everyone. And here's some example, just one example of um, the coordinated integrated fire stair exit signage, which has, which has to be on every level. And then the directional signage showing some of the pictograms. Um, this project is a really delicate and lovely health center project um, called Casey House. Um, it's a blood disorder clinic and um, we've got their beautiful range of colours 
you know, obviously related back to blood and so on. And um, it's not just a digital or a vinyl applied graphic. It's each colored block is has been colored purposefully and it makes a beautiful integrated pattern. And what we're able to do is bring that pattern, as you can see here, as part of the internal um, identification signage all the way through. But here's some examples of the door signage and showing the inclusive messaging here. So this washroom is for everyone. And the way that the pictograms are done as well, so you can't tell whether that's male or female, it really is for everyone. But the one on the right is accessible as well. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's braille underneath uh, the messaging for both of those signs. And this one's a lovely example, um, just quiet space, be respectful and braille. This next case study is uh, for Planned Parenthood, as you can see there. And we have welcome sign and again, being looking at cultural diversity, the welcome in many languages. So um, just this one's a really great example of the center bank there of rooms is the orange area. And you can see there a little bit um, beneath the door numbers are in orange discs. So to make that really clear, we have orange lighting banding around that space. And likewise for all the other areas, the purple and the yellow and around the corner, the green and the blue, the other side. It's all coordinated and integrated. What and again, do those this colors one, signify, Jan. Sorry. Um, they would be, um, I'd have to check, Kirsty, but they would be for whatever is like the, the purpose for each area. So, you know, it, it would link back to, like the previous example, you might have something that's red relating to. Um, you know, a blood disorder clinic or something like that. Um, there's some more images of it here. So that's the pink, like the deep pink color. Um, I couldn't tell you which rooms they are, Kirsty, I have to check, but that's what they would be for. They'd be the purpose of um, the rooms. So um, there's another case study I've got here, if we've got time. I think we're going all right with time. Um, this one's called uh, Artscape Daniels Launch Pad, Pad, and this one is in Toronto. It's a it's just down the road from our office actually, and it's a fantastic example of um, a company um, creating this hub, this space for artists to get their um, careers and their businesses off the ground. So it's called Launch Pad for that reason, for to support artists launching their businesses. So our involvement here started at brand and then went right through to merchandise. And there's some examples of the bags. Um, uh, the, because of the brand and designing that line coming um, off the brand for the launching of the businesses, we've taken that angled line all the way through so you'll see here on some of the uh, columns inside the building and the identification sign here, the commons, and also all the pictograms, I don't know if you can see those on the doors, but um, we've taken, we've done a whole suite of bespoke pictograms. There they are. So completely bespoke. Uh, I've never worked on a project like this, that are this um, individualized and beautifully done. With, and they're also playful. They're really, um, you know, it fits for this type of, type of creative community. And here's an example of um, simple graphics, just vinyl on the glazing. I've got one more case study. Uh, so this one is completely different. We would never get this, a project like this here in Australia, but this is um, in Nunavut right up in the Arctic, there's a college, would you believe, a university. Uh, so we worked on that, um, again, very coordinated with the architects. And this one is a really special one. I 
for me, I've never worked on um, bilingual projects um, and I really want to, hopefully soon. But this one is in four languages. So you've got the Nunavut, um, there's two local languages there. Um, and then you have French um, underneath and of course English. So designing with bilingual work, I mean, it's, it's incredible because you have to work out your spatial planning and it's difficult enough with one language. But you can see here on the directory boards how beautifully planned out it is and messages are in chunks, so in hierarchy and they can be understood and of course the level numbers and the beautiful designs um, mimicking the architecture outside the building with the folds there. And the other one I really love, um, and we all do love this one, is the pictograms that have been drawn from the um, local the parkers. So the, the, that's the female parker there and then the smaller sign, there's the male one. And, you know, individualizing it and making it completely bespoke for that college. Now, I don't know how we're going for time here, Kirsty. I can't see the time clock. Oh, but we're, um, we're good with time, actually. We're sort of getting up to 22, so we're getting up to question Okay. Time. Yeah, so it's okay. perfect. All right. So, look, I've got some resources here for you, and I'm sure Kirsty will be able to distribute this um, if, if you can't access it, of course, from the recording. Um, there's a couple of pages there which is you know you can go down with rabbit holes with this sort of reading and research um, these are links for Australia and all around the world but um, very interesting if you wanted to do some research on universal design and that's it for me so thank you so much for for joining us today um, it was really great to have you here oh it was really great to have you Jan thank you very much <laughs> That Thanks, really Kirsty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, we ha now have time for questions. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jose. Um, so uh, does anyone have any questions they would like uh, to ask Jan? You can either put them up on the chat or um, put your hand up, um, either a virtual hand or a real hand. Um, to uh, to ask uh, questions, we might. Um, Jan, do you want to stop sharing your screen now, and then we can see everyone sure. on the page too? That's great. Thank great. you. Great. Anyone got any? I've got a question. If no one else does, but I'll wait to see if uh, if people have a question first. Ah, I have Karen. One. Karen. Karen. Uh, who wants? No, no, Karen, I think first. Okay. Karen, okay. Okay. Um, thanks so much, Jan. That was really fascinating. Um, I'm working, teaching a class in curatorial practice in um, the fine art program this semester. And one of the things we've been looking at is the kind of the way that an exhibition can be a narrative in space. And I wondered, just based on your experience, uh, whether you could talk a little more about wayfaring within exhibition spaces, if that's something that you've done, um, and how that might fold into the great the wayfaring around um, museum and gallery buildings as a whole. Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks, Karen. Um, one of our the creative director I actually worked on with the museum. He is an exhibition designer as well. Um, I'm, I'm dying to work with him on an exhibition. He's so wonderful. So. I'm not the expert to answer that, but from what I've seen of his work, it's beautiful storytelling. So I think what I've seen is distilling the stories and how you want that narrative to be told and then mm -hmm. taking people on the journey throughout the exhibition. And I know with wayfinding and graphics, as far as the level of the information, so the hierarchy of information on displays is really important because you have some people that I think, as we all know, we can browse or we might just want to read a headline and keep moving. Mm. But if you want to delve more into the story, um, there's usually three levels of information. So you might stand there and read the next paragraph, or if you wanted to 
stand there for longer and really immerse yourself in the exhibition. There's another level of finer print, if you like. So I think that's for me how it works. I'd love to get his perspective, but that's that's what I can mm -hmm. see. And there's one exhibition that he designed is a really beautiful interactive part of the exhibition as well. It's a it's a weaving exhibition, um, and it's it's up. It's not as far as Nunavut, but it's it's like traditional weaving practices and all the history of that area. And what he did was create a digital display. So you could actually sit at the display and create your own weaving patterns. Oh, cool. Um, and then you'd see the whole um, rug or the whole um, pattern appear as you created it. Mm. So I think there's some fun things that you can do and mm. he's amazing. So <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like, yeah, really interesting possibilities of using that um, kind of an inclusive design approach to signal how people can engage with the work as well because it's such a an interesting barrier where um, in kind of really expanded art practices and curatorial practice you want people to interact and engage and touch or do and yet there's also that kind of burden of needing to signal where that's not appropriate or where that is appropriate so yeah really interesting to think about that as part of the communication strategy that has to be built here. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. That's a pleasure. And you also got all the um, audio as well, depending mm. on the exhibition. So that's another level. Yeah. yeah. And I really love that um, sensory mapping. That's such a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Berlin, did you want to, do you have a question? Yes, yes. Well, my question is a bit more boring, sorry. <laughs> but but uh, we, I was working on a school project recently and now it's built. And we we did this, coordinate the signage for the, the classrooms as well. And because it was for kids, we wanted to have it a, bit, a little bit more playful. But then we had a lot of recurrent conversations because you, this statutory, signage that of course you have to comply certain dimensions and words and things like that and we, we kept talking in the studio about the word unisex because that's one of the words that is kind of there that is hard to kind of remove and but we wanted to to change that word because we thought it was not very inclusive of everyone and we ended up using all gender so I just want because of your of course you have a lot of expertise in that Part. I just wanted to, you know, to know what do you think which actually words are more inclusive because sometimes you can't be so much, so you have a restrictions on how much playful you can be. <laughs> and there are words that, you know, you need to comply, but, but still you want to do something, you know, if it's for kids, softer or nicer yeah, or, or actually for everyone, right? But yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's great because this is a real life example that we're facing on projects all the time because yeah. um, clients aren't often um, willing to go with us on this and they would prefer to have unisex. So um, it's, it's a bit tricky, but you, you're right with what you're saying with designing within the code, we have to do that to be certified and tick all the boxes for um, certification. So it has to be there. So the naming, the tactile, the braille, um, what we can do, though, is um, have that more playful layer or more bespoke designed layer um, on the doors or on the entry doors. Like you see, I showed there um, an example of a, like a large pictograms. Um, we're doing that on projects at the moment. So you might have almost life-size images of an outline of a pictogram before you actually get to the amenity where you have to have the code signage. So there's areas like that that you can apply a more playful universal approach. Um, but I, I really love the example you gave and your solution. It's, is it's there good. any word that is better for everyone in your expertise or all gender is good enough or? Uh, it's, it's like we're still working with it too, but I think it's, I don't know if it's good enough, but I think it's good, really good um, because it's inclusive and it's saying, it's just like our work where we've got everyone or, or for everyone. So yeah. it's the same. I think it's the same thing. 
Mm. Just a different lens, really. Yeah. But yeah, nice work. Because <laughs> we, we often suggest that and clients won't go with it. So it's it was a time. process, but it, it was a process for because of course you need to get approval by many, many people. I know. <laughs> it was, yeah. But it worked. It worked yeah. the fight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good because there's there's part of the collaboration again as well because you know you have to get approval by so many people within the stakeholder teams and yeah. it's quite arduous and often we don't get the result that we would like so yeah you've you found exactly that on that project mm. thank you, thank you. thanks much. karen and belen for your questions that's really great Anyone else got any questions before I pipe up with mine? <laughs> no, and there's nothing in the chat? No. Okay, my question um, is related to um, the neurodiversity example that you provided us with, with the museum and the different spaces, you know, levels of, um, of, of um, sensory intensity. And I was thinking you know, like a museum is probably a bit easier to control in that, in that, in that uh, case. But how do we design for neurosensitive or neurodiverse people who have those types of sensitivities when we're designing for really much more public and everyday spaces and I was thinking of shopping centres because I'm I'm not a neurodiverse uh, neurosensitive person, but but I also can get quite agitated in those spaces because they are so intense. Um, so I can imagine that that people who have that high sensitivity would find that really difficult. So have you got any thoughts around that? Yeah, that's a great example, Kirsty, because I'm like you, I. I can only stay in the shopping centre for a certain amount of time and it's it's overload. Um, it's a really tricky one because I've worked on a lot of retail centres and our brief is it's all about sales mm. and the shopping centre itself, their client is the tenants, the retailers. So if the re retailers aren't doing well, then mm. they're not doing well. And you'll notice, and as we all know, that each retailer, they're blaring music, they've got scent, smells coming out through the air conditioning to draw people in, and it's everyone's competing. So that's why we feel like that. Um, I think with a retail centre, it's extremely difficult. There might be areas like, well, not kids' play areas because that's going to be even more so, but like perhaps prayer rooms or quiet spaces that you could go to but I've never seen them at all mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah it's that shopping centers retail is really tricky um, yeah because be I have nice. seen that mm. well, I think Woolies and Coles now have um, certain times of the day and week where they lower the lights and they uh -huh. make sure there are no loudspeaker notices and stuff going on. But it's, you know, uh -huh. it's sort of one or two days a week for an hour, you know, like if you can't go at that time, you know, too bad kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, I was just wondering if there might be a bit more sort of happening in that field because it, it must be quite difficult. Mm. Yeah, and look, that's an interesting one too, Woolies and Coles, because that's the tenant, that's the individual mm. controlling their environment. So the shopping centres are different. They, they're right. not going to yeah. be promoting that at all. But I think mm. that's a fantastic initiative with lowering the lights um, mm. and keeping the sound down. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one with retail mm. because it's mm. all about sales and all about yeah. money. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but no. I, I think like um, the museums apps and galleries absolutely can control mm. it. Uh, we're working on a big project at the moment, which is um, actually the Western Sydney Airport. And the amount of um, areas there, like prayer rooms, and there's even rooms that for your um, guide dog. So there's pet relief and the mm. pictograms that we've got all going with those it's, it's super interesting and so there are <laughs> quiet spaces there yes interesting <laughs> pet relief <laughs> <Dog pee. laughs> yeah, <I don't> know. <laughs> yeah yeah 
so there's there's some great things that you can do. Um, I think um, it, you know, people are becoming more aware, like even lights flashing and so on um, for epilepsy and mm. things like that. So um, designers are becoming more aware um, and I think clients are too. Yeah. So we'll get there. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, well, thank you very much for that. Um, any other, does that conversation spurred any other questions from anyone? Um, I guess it's a question about the intro, intro about the, your company. It, the, I saw that one of the, about, aside of all the things that you do, there is one uh, as area that is art public, public art. Oh yes, public art. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What what kind yeah. of projects do you develop there? Well, they're they're mainly projects that we're working on that we have the opportunity to do a large sculptural element, uh, which is part of the wayfinding. I didn't have any examples, but there mm. are uh, examples on our website if you wanted to have a look. Um, but for example, there's uh, um, in one of the universities there's a, a dairy. Um, agricultural um, campus and this particular part of the campus um, was all about milking cows and so mm. the graphics we had in there were cows and like um, positive negative shapes of the colors of the cows but outside at the entrance to that campus we have um, a really large milk bottle and it's contemporary um, milk bottle with lines and shapes and lighting so from a distance you can see it's a milk bottle but up close it would look like a big structure and but beautifully designed so that's the sort of um, public art that we we do um, mainly connected with our programs mm. that's cool it's right. fun yeah i see uh, okay. yeah no, i, I see was it. looking at yeah yeah yeah, yeah the milk bottle <laughs> Yeah. 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 And uh, we've got some comments. Um, Annalise and Irene, or is it Irina? Um, or Irina. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation. I think you can see those in the in the chat there. So thanks for your comments. That's really lovely. Thanks, Irina. And Annalise, that's that's lovely. Thank you. And, and Kimberly. Yes, Kim Kim Bailey maybe. What Kim Bailey? Oh yeah. no, Kimberly. No, yeah, you're right. Kimberly. Thank you. I, I, I used to do a silly question to all the presenters, and it's about <laughs> uh -oh. and it's, <laughs> how how do you feel on Mondays? <laughs> ah, well, that's a good point. I feel better on this Monday than <laughs> other Mondays because this okay. has been fun. So yeah, <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. nice. That's good. That's oh, it's good. really nice to meet you all. I hope that's been of interest um, and also inspiring to be in this field of a career because it's, I have to say, we need more and more people to come through the universities because there's not enough wayfinding designers coming through. And mm. so people like myself, are looking for designers and there's not enough designers to hire so keep going <laughs> keep <laughs> studying and um yeah I'd be excited to see who comes through the courses that you're teaching thank you yes we've got some good students that's for sure so that's really good yeah, yeah it's good um well, so i think we should probably wrap up um because i just a question to you um hmm. For everyone, um, we this is being recorded. Where will they find the recordings once? Um... Yes, we will uh, send another email uh, with the YouTube channel, but we are also going to have to set up a website, a microsite, where you, these videos from the YouTube channel will be linked. So, I mean, it's, it's taking a little bit, but uh, I will try to get it done along this week at some point. Okay, great. Okay, and then I will put all this recording and the other one and the rest, the previous ones. All right, and if people um, who are, you know, 
viewing this who aren't Utah students? Will they also have access to? Yes, yes, points? it will be public access. You know, even, even the microsite will be a pu public access is as long as they have the link. I will put it in the Eventbrite uh, page. Right. That is our main page, public main page, where everyone can have an access to the to YouTube channel. So yes, it, it should be easy going. And if right. you are li listening, if you are watching these videos, because you figure it out. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, no, okay. I will put it on social media as well. So, right. so I will try to spread the voice. Great. Thanks very much, Jose. And thank you so much, Jan. That's just fantastic. Oh, thank thanks, you for Kirsten. being with us today. Yeah. Oh, that's an absolute pleasure. And thanks, everybody, for uh, attending. And it was really nice to meet you all. And thanks, Jose, for looking after us. No worries. Technology. And thank you, everyone, for being <laughs> yeah. here and okay. for contributing. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.